Hey, this is Herman Lee from Dragon Force, and you are watching Guitar Autopsy. So, Herman, how you doing today, brother? It's good to have you on the show. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here on Guitar Autopsy. Well, thank you very much, man. So tell us a little bit about what you've been up to lately. Uh, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. What do I do in my life? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, the, least, the thing I do the least amount I can tell you is playing the guitar. Right. Um, everything else more. You know, your life kind of shifts, right? When you're young, you play more guitar and do everything else less. Yes. And when you're older, you play guitar the least amount. So I probably played about, I don't know, two hours maximum this last two weeks or something. But I've been good, you know, just doing the usual, having, yeah. um, you know, doing the band, doing everything that involves being a guitar player. Right. So are you guys getting ready to do any touring? Um, no, actually. <laughs> you know, we had the... We had a European tour, which was meant to be an arena tour, mm -hmm. um, postponed for a year, which I thought was good because it's really not a time to do an arena tour, you know, indoor in right. Europe. Yeah. Um, I was glad about that. And, you know, we're actually working on a US tour for March and April mm -hmm. next year. Um, you know, I got to do all the back end stuff, being a guitar player, band manager, you know, being the most annoying guy in the band, in the band, pretty much. <laughs> and everything else that comes with it. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, so I didn't know that you were, you know, you take on all those responsibilities, band manager. That's that's no easy task. Yeah, it's um, I don't know what choices you got. You know, when it comes to um, being a musician now, it's kind yeah. of it's kind of tricky. You don't have to do it, but. Then you look at the numbers and the accounting mm -hmm. and then you think, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then you look back, it's like beyond about the number, actually, because they use number to pressure to you into doing something in terms of music. Right. So, it, it, you know, there's I don't really believe 100 percent that someone else, you know, when it comes to money, they're not going to influence you. Yeah. You know, in some way. Um, you know, just from my experience, right? I'm a, I'll give a little bit of history. So to you and the listener of your shows is, you know, I started the Dragon Force with Sam back in 99. I managed the band all the way up until 2006. I found the publishing deal, the record deals, the lawyers, do the mp3.com stuff, you know, finding place to do demo, where to record the album, production, pretty much everything, right? And at that point, you think about it, all these years, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just reading some books, look at whatever resources there on the internet, talking to people, being in the scene, going out a lot. Yeah. And, and then in 2006, I got management, you know, because we got so busy and we wanted to go and get drunk and, <laughs> right. and you know, we've yeah. done all our playing, we've done all our work and let's, let's, let's enjoy something that we thought, you know, going on tour is about and playing live music and just doing the whole thing, having fun and partying. So and then we got management and then I took over, took back, you know, management about, I guess, four years ago. And, you know, after looking at the way things been going and things that we, you know, during that period, what went wrong and what should have been done. And you can't look back at everything, right? When you look back, you look at accounting, you look at every single thing about your business and what decision you made and band member changes and all that. And, and, you know, things have been better than ever, but at that point, you know, when you're young, what am I to argue with someone that has been in the music industry as a professional longer than me, right? I'm just a guitar player. I just learn stuff and hopefully it works. So, you know, you get talked into doing management you know, <laughs> in a certain way and decisions that are made, you think, well, that guy's supposed to know. And I'm not saying there are no good managers out there. I mean, at least in my situation, I thought, well, to be honest, I think getting management is probably one of the worst moves in my career. You know, by then the band was blowing up anyway. You could have anyone to come in and did okay. Do you know what I mean? 
because we were riding on a trend, we're suddenly cool, even though we never meant to be cool playing guitars, the way, you know, solos and stuff, you know, we're like, you think about it, Rusty, you, you guys, you were like the black sheep of music for like so many years, right? Um, so it was going to happen anyway. So it was debatable, like, well, was the, did the manager do anything or they just took percentage and made it worse? <laughs> I think I think that you mentioned something there about treating your band like a business rather than just, you know, I mean, obviously you wanted to have fun, you wanted to do certain things, but I think that that might be a huge downfall for a lot of bands is that they just want to be a band and they don't focus on those things and then they either get screwed behind the scenes from somebody or they get, or some people even say they've gotten screwed by people who have been lying to their face the whole time in the band, you know, like they let somebody in the band take care of it that that shouldn't have been taking care of it and they're off buying jet skis and cool stuff while you're struggling to tour. And I, I think that if people took that look at their their band as a business rather than just something cool to go do, I feel like, you know, cause especially like for Dragon Force, you know, you guys could have very easily just fallen off track, you know, and then never been heard of again, but you took the reins and you said, no, we're gonna make sure people know about us. And I think that that's really cool. Yeah. I mean how uncool is it when you started a band with a bunch of friends to talk about business, right? Right. Let's leave the dirty work to someone else to do it. Let's leave the difficult situation. Um, and that's, under, that is a great thing. I'm having a manager is to offload them the shit that you don't want to talk about. But the reality is you have to be able to talk about it because you guys are friends or, you know, you guys have some kind of relationship musically that that bad you should be able to break those barriers, you know, if you guys can connect musically. I know it's difficult. I mean, we're humans, right? We just fuck, fucked up with flaws everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's crazy though, man. I mean, you know, and things are, have changed so much from, you know, when I was growing up and, and I'm sure a lot has changed uh, with you too. I think I'm about 10 years older than you. Um, but it's like, you know, when I was a kid, it, all you had to do was play guitar. You know, because that was way before any of the stuff that's going on now. You know, it wasn't even heard of to be your own manager or, you know, that whole thing. It was always like, oh, I got to get a record deal and get signed and, and everybody takes care of their parts. And it's just not like that anymore. Uh, it's so different. So what was it that made you decide to take the reins back from the guy that was managing the band? Um I think a lot of things was happening throughout the years that I wasn't happy about. I mean, we made great albums and music and stuff, but I all, it's just like the mind of a guitar player. You always want to get better and do things better. And not just in terms of playing and business, but in terms of relationship with other people, in terms of business people you deal with. And a certain relationship in the business, I thought it's like, oh, why does that guy hate us? We don't hate them. Oh, there's someone screaming at him on the phone. You know, the manager was screaming at him, fucking shouting at him until he gets what he wants. Like, that's not how you do business. That's certainly not the Dragon Force vibe. You know, everyone in the band is very chill, very cool and relaxed. You know, there's certain things. That's kind of an old school management kind of way. I mean, it works in the past. I don't know if it works now. I mean, I'm sure it works based on maybe, you know, your power on your strength of what you hold, your cards that you hold as a manager. But I think at least... Um, it wasn't what reflected the band in reality of who we are. Having someone angry screaming at somebody. Sure. That, that's, <laughs> things have changed tremendously, that's for sure. I mean, you know, with the technology, I mean, you can write your own albums at your house and put them out and be just as good as, you know, a big studio. You know, that changes the game a lot as well, for sure. Yeah. Technology. And, and then, of course, you know, we, we were actually just talking before you jumped on about social media and, you know, the kind of the power it has, but also the power it takes away from people too. You know, you become like a victim to the trends that are going on. And then I think people start losing themselves a little bit. You know, they start losing what it is that they want and who they are. And then I think their music starts reflecting that or they just don't do anything because it's just stupid. You know what I mean? So like they just decide as this is dumb, I don't want to deal with it. Like, you know, we were talking about TikTok and a bunch of other stuff before you jumped on here. And, and what, what I'd like to say, too, is you you have really taken, I think, social media and turned it into something good for guitarists and musicians, not just, you know, you didn't just follow every single theme that was going out there today and doing some of the, the dumb stuff. And I think that's why, honestly, you 
are kind of where you're at on that social media platform, not just because, you know, you're good at the guitar, but it's like there's a lot of good guitar players, you know, but then they fall into that pit of just the social media despair. And then, then they get pissed because it doesn't work today. And then they just fall off. You know what I mean? I mean, I think, I think, you know, the conversation we have here, most listeners probably agree is most people fall into a trend of the way you dress, the way you play music or what's popular out there. You know, there's a huge strength out there that forces people to do certain things, go buy stuff, go buy things, buy the latest phone. And and you guys are definitely not, the, you know, the follower. I mean, Rusty, you like the anti-grunge, anti, you know, non-playing guitar player. So um, I'm not saying we should all go against what's the trend, but we have to just follow what we are and what we believe in. So Herman, dude, so how did you discover the whole Twitch thing? How did you discover it was a thing? Or did you even try to make it a thing? You just kind of sort of started doing it. So I had an account of Twitch for a while, just watching people play video games. And, and I wasn't really thinking so much about it. And to be honest, the original guy who made it work is Matt Heafy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw Matt Heafy's thing. I thought, oh, that's cool. It's not, it's not lame to play guitar on stream. <laughs> um, it's, he made it cool. You know, he had his own thing doing and Matt Heafy changes stuff quite a bit, you know, throughout his four years of streaming. And I kind of start, started one year after him. Um, we run very different kind of things. Um, you know, he does his thing and I do kind of my thing. And they really, um, I think it's, you know, with different audience, same but different, you know, that depends sometimes you want to see his stuff, sometimes you want to see his, uh, my stuff. Um, and I just started doing it, um, playing some games and people of course ask for guitar playing and my view on the guitar. And, and to be honest, I'm never, I was never really the confident guy in a way that I think, who gives a shit what I got to say? Who really cares? You know, I, my opinion is worthless. You know, it's just, I just do my thing. You guys like it. That's cool. If you don't, I don't really care either. You know, if you want to hate me, that's fine. <laughs> um, but people, people enjoyed it and it slowly evolved, right? Slowly, you know, from just playing some Dragon Force songs to setting up guitar, showing people, giving them some knowledge on, guitar setup and why certain guitar is built in a certain way. And then all the way to, of course, I think the biggest achievement I've done was the Jason Becker fundraiser, which you've been part of, you know, to raise more than $540,000 wow. for Jason Becker. That's amazing. Man. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, it was, it was a lot of work, but I'm really happy I did it. And especially, you know, to think about it this way, right. In my, in my, in my point of view, I wrote to Jason Becker back in the 90s, you know, after reading his um, Guitar for the Practicing, Practicing Musician article, and he wrote back to me as well. And, you know, and years down the line, I, you know, it became this, right? Can you believe it? I mean, I able to right. help someone who's one of the most talented, inspiring yeah, sure, man. musician in the world that inspired all of us here. Yeah, yeah and beyond. Sure. 100%. Well, I've actually got uh, Michael Lee Ferkins, who did some of his albums back in the day. He lives here in my hometown uh, and he lives in California and here. So he travels back and forth and he's from here and he, he's teaching in one of my rooms. Uh, and we're going to get him on the show, I think, too. And he was telling me some stories about Jason Becker. And I was like, don't tell me about these. Just wait till you're on the show because I want to like, I want to actually be surprised and happy about all of these things. And, you know, yeah. so I, he's got a lot of cool stories about Jason too, I think. And, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. I got him to sign my CDs when he played in London as a guitar show. Uh, he played Rain in a Tunnel in a complete different take. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a total guitar nerd, right? I went to see every single guitar clinic guitar player that was out there back then g3 i went to three shows or three shows in london i went to all three you know literally people remembered me you know i was like in in the line in the queue for every single concert i had like a dream theater t-shirt or something that no one would wear right which is i like a tony mccalpine t-shirt at some yeah, point yeah, yeah violent machine tour or something you know <laughs> crazy man crazy yeah that's awesome dude yeah so Tell me, you know, I mean, we kind of talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, who, who all got you inspired to play? I mean, who were your main influences in the beginning? 
I think what got me into music in the first place was hearing guitar solos from Bon Jovi,、um, like the slippery when wet those songs, right? They were big in the radio, like Living on、yeah. a Prayer and all these things. Like I, I, I remember, I still remember these days hearing this kind of sound. I go, wow, this sounds really cool. I didn't know what it was.、Um, hearing Europe, you know, Europe, then the final countdown. That is a mean solo as well. That's for sure.、Um, and that kind of got me into really actually music. But I didn't start playing the guitar, and I was like eleven years old then.、Um, I was in France at that time, and then I didn't. It didn't really kick off until I was sixteen to start playing the guitar, and I was really into like Brian Adams actually, the guitar solos on "Waking Up the Neighbors." I thought, man, they're so melodic, and of course, you know, I was into Megadeth, Metallica, and you got into Pantera. I mean, yeah, this this like. The riffing, the solos, and Dream Theater guitar, you know, or Satriani, all these things, kind of got me into it. But the hard rock music, I think, the melodic solos in hard rock from the eighties is what I gravitated to. Because when I started playing guitar, it was like the beginning of the grunge era. You know, I never was into it、um, during the eighties. You know, my eighties really short for me, like two years. You know, when I. And then the nineties, there's some obviously still some music, and I hear on radio Metallica and Kiss,、um, you know the commercial stuff, and that, that kind of it made me like guitar music more and more. Kind of grew into playing guitar at the age of sixteen. That must have been really tough、uh, coming into it right at the beginning of the grunge era. You know, <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine. I mean, I know how tough it was. You know, just trying to do what I was doing. You know, or to to have come from when it was cool to all of a sudden it's not cool, you know. So I can't imagine starting at that time. You know, it would have been so easy to get influenced by other things. You know,、um, which is not such a bad thing. I mean, you know, who knows what it could have turned out to be? But, but you know, being into that style of music was very difficult. You know,、um, for me, it was hard to find new things to listen to because nobody was putting out anything I liked. You know, so it, it was. It was difficult for me to find new inspiration. You know, that's when I started listening to、um, more heavy music because there was still there was still a lot of good riffs and killer drums、uh, in the heavier stuff, which I never listened to really before、um, that whole dark era of heavy metal with no guitar solos. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like sacrilege. Come on, man! People cutting their hair off, wearing big giant pants, and I don't know, man. It was a trip. But,、um, it was,、uh, you know, that's when I anyway. Backing up, that's when I discovered bands like Arch Enemy and Nevermore and、um, Sugar and stuff like that, and that, I started getting my inspiration from that, and that's what kind of led me into the little bit heavier、um, direction of music as well. So, if anything, that you know, I got that out of it. That's for sure, you know. And it just solidified, you know, how much more I wanted to continue to do what I do. You know, it's always been about that. You know, you just gotta you gotta do what you believe in.、Um, you know. Be, If you try to stay trendy or current, you know, you know, you're just going to keep chasing that 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 wave, and it's never going to happen because it's going to keep changing, and you're just trying to catch up, you know. So you always got to do what you do, you know. You know, with me, I, it was it was tough because I was never cool in school, so everyone was making fun of my accents anyway and doing racist stuff to me when I was in the in school. Oh man! So it's like I was never able to. I was never into something that was. Trendy that could fit into a group. So I was into video games, but video games was not cool back then. You know, it's like, oh, what a nerd! He's playing whatever Mega Drive, <laughs> Genesis, Sega. Oh God, wow, you know, they're making fun of me. And then I got into guitar, and you know, listening to Metallica, Megadeth, Pantera—that's acceptable stuff. But then it's like, you know what? Shit, Dream Theater, sick, Symphony X, oh yeah, Steve Park, Satriani. All this stuff, and I found I got back and discovered George Lynch. Wow, these guys are absolutely out of control. You know, it's like oh, and that time is like oh my god, you're going backwards. Everyone else is listening to cool stuff. Um, I guess I just didn't care. You know, when you just been when you just been meet. You know, when people just like be mean at you for like so many years. Being mean, it's. I was like known as like the worst guitar player back in school. They were like, so I had a band. And we're trying to do like thrash metal, like 
it was some Metallica, Megadeth, Anthrax cover. So the school actually took off my rehearsal times. They used to have like rooms you can go and rehearse. It's like, because it's like, sorry, you don't really fit into the, to the program of the music department. You guys, everyone's playing nice music, or at least something that people want to hear. You play fucking thrash. Yeah, you right. <laughs> now you listen to it, it's not even that heavy, but for that time, that stuff was heavy, unless you're going to play death covers and, and stuff. <laughs> yeah. I was like the weird kid in high school, man, because, you know, I grew up in a super small town right outside. You've been you've been to Nebraska, I assume, on a tour at some point or maybe just driven through a bunch of corn. And mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's basically my, my high school had 400 people from grade seven up until grade 12. So my graduating class was like 40 people. We've all known each other since like first grade. And I was the only kid that really liked metal. And I started growing my hair out. I was weird and. You know, they had like drive your tractor to school day. I wasn't about that, dude. Like that wasn't me. And, you know, so I can kind of relate with what you're saying there. It's like, you just got to know what you want to do and just do it and to hell with whatever everybody else kind of says about you, you know? Dude, that's yeah, awesome. I, drive your tractor to school. It, yeah. It must be tough to, you know, to grow up in a small town, small town and being different from everyone else in such a small community because you're even more weird, right? I live in London, so... We got everyone dressed in all kind of different ways, you know. There's sure. a lot of things happening, but it's just, um, you know, when you're young, young, young kids are just mean to each other, right? You know, this you're learning how the world goes, and yeah, they don't know you. Um, yeah, but it seems <laughs> like people still don't freaking know, even and though you know they're what? supposed they're right. to be they, adults. They, adults are like the worst. They, the the adults in power, even the worst, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's something you brought up earlier, you know about how people would make fun of you for your accent and, you know, your, your, your race, because you're living in London, but you, you know, you're not that ethnicity of that, you know, country. And it's like, you still kind of see that on some of your videos, even still, you know, like comments and stuff where they're like, yeah, this guy's a good guitar player, but his accent's weird. And it's like, well, what the fuck do you care? And what does it matter? Like, that's so weird to me. Like, and these are like 30, 40 year old people that it should know better, you know, or should, you know, if it's some little kid and they don't understand, okay, you can kind of go here, let me teach you. But it's like, you can't teach somebody who's 40, 50 years old, who's still an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're not going to figure it out, dude. No, man. So, uh, so I, I, I apologize, you know, for most of those people, if, you know, because like who, nobody should care, but it's so stupid. Well, it's like, you know, I heard somebody commented on Buckethead one time and said, oh, I just can't get past the whole bucket and the way he dresses. It's like, well, don't look at him. Listen to his music. You know, I don't, I don't get it. You know, yeah. it's kind of weird, um, <laughs> you know, to me. I don't, I don't know. I've always, you know, growing up, I've always had people that would just, couldn't never listen to whatever I was listening to, couldn't get into it. It was always like, oh, I can't listen to that because of the singer. I can't listen to that because of this. It's like, I never understood that. I'm like a fan of music in general, you know. There's some, I can find something I like about just about anything, you know. And it always kind of freaks me out, especially when it's musicians that are like narrow minded. They're like, oh, I can't listen to that. Or where you get these guys that are just hardcore, just metal heads or prog rockers or, or whatever. And they don't they don't stray out of that that little medium. It's like there's so much more out there that you can learn and grow from. That's for sure. You know what I mean? I mean, that's that's what keeps me going. Just listening to everything else. You know, it's, it's almost you know, like food, right? Kids don't eat as much food. As you grow older, you eat more and more of different type of food, maybe. Right. You know, like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the way it is. You know, to be honest, I, I, I understand it is. I mean, but I think we're in a better place now, I think, um, with the younger people, um, you know, I think majority-wise. Um, I think they're starting to come along. Yeah, I mean, look, I... I look at it this way. I didn't ex I didn't expect instrumental music to really make a comeback after the death of you know the shrapnel records and you know of course Steve I Satriani, they're still doing the shows there, you know, packing them out, you know, doing incredible shows, but they had such a huge reach back then, you know, and huge audience, such a long career. And seeing I guess Tosin and Animals as leaders, you know, you coming in is with music that is really not a easy listening kind of music, doing thumping and eight string extended scale. Um, it, it's, it is pretty incredible. Like bands like Polyphia, right? Coming in, 
and doing something different. You just never thought there would be um, that way. It would be that way. But I mean, to be honest, it's still very hard to do instrumental to a, to a huge scale. Um, yeah, but those guys are, are those guys are all doing really well. I mean, cons all things considered, you know, back in the day, you know, I don't think you know guys like Vinnie Moore and Tony McAlpine were, you know, doing that kind of stuff like these guys are doing. You know, as far as the the size of shows that they're doing and stuff like that, it was pretty unheard of for instrumental stuff. You know, I remember going to see Cacophony at a club here in Houston and just being, you know, the like fifty of the musician guys and guitar players in town, you know, there to see it. You know what I mean? So it's uh. It's crazy. It's it's uh it's very awesome. I went to see uh, Jason Richardson when he came through Houston. He was open for Polyphia, and he said every show on this on the that tour had been sold out. You know that was fucking crazy, man. You know it's mm -hmm. cool to see today's you know youth and kids getting into uh, instrumental music. I never thought I'd see that day. You know it's pretty cool, for sure. So, dude, let's talk about this. All these guitars on your wall back here, man. What do you got going on? This is a new place, too, from last time I, I was hanging out with you. Yeah, right. there's not enough guitars at the moment because I only got 10 stands just to test the wall. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to stack about, you know, I have way more guitars and they're in different sure. rooms than in cases. Yeah. But I just got a few up. I'm waiting for these stands, um, you know, to, um, to, to actually put as many as possible. I thought I'd make the most sure. ridiculous guitar world on Twitch. Um, you know, like a shot. But we got some good stuff here um, right now. Um, that one there, that is my custom Ibanez E-Gen 18, which got the... Actually, I'll show it to you. Which has the light, of oh, course, wow. the LED. It's actually our battery at the moment, so these two won't, won't light up when it's our battery. Um, but it does the chase mode, right? That's the oh wow, that's the cool that one. That is obviously. super cool, dude. I've never seen that before. Yeah, wow. That's, uh... <laughs> I like that. So tell yeah. me about the, what is that technology? I mean, what they just put like LEDs all through the neck when it was built? Um, this one actually, unfortunately, they had to steam the the fretboard off because the, mm -hmm. the guitar was built. So these guitars are built in. Um, on the production line, I'm not actually a custom guitar lover. What, I'm, what I mean is I've seen too many custom guitar go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like, well, I like custom guitar on the production line. So they make a bunch of them, the same person, the same team, right? There's less chance of error. Um, so they had, to, you know, obviously the neck, everything was already there. So we have to steam off the neck. Um, fretboard in order to put the LED in. It's actually put in by Broad Axe Guitars in Orange County, in Los Angeles, in California. Um, he did that for me. Um, the guy's called Chris. He used to work at Roland. That's where I met him um, when he was working at Roland. And he does a bunch of stuff for guitars, custom guitars. So give him a shout out, you know. Sure, man. Um, yeah. he's, he's a guitar player. He, he has a Dream Theater cover band as well. Oh, tribute. nice. So he can play. That's um, ambitious. Yeah, he did that for me. Um, you know, it's great for the show. You know, it's I, I, the first show I ever went to was Steve by Sex and Religion tour, and seeing Steve the way he performed and all that, you know, the effects, you know, the lights and the way he plays the guitar. Um, I think, how would I say it? Something that I I was learning a lot when I was growing up was watching rock stars play the guitar. Mm -hmm. More than instructional. I thought instructional was just super boring. I would actually start to get, fall asleep <laughs> watching people show me scales. Yeah, but yeah, seeing yeah. like Slash on the stage looking cool, yeah. seeing Vi, yeah. seeing Satriani, you know, the extremist video, the car crashing. And mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, this is like when Dragon Force started, I thought, look, 90% of people is not going to give a shit about where my fingers are flying. Yeah. So, you got to cover the ground on that. It's make an exciting live show and have cool mm -hmm. stuff, change of guitar colors mm -hmm. and all the things that people will notice yeah. if they're not into just like the details. So, you know, I have a, so many guitars in different colors um, with different stuff, you know, put in. That's pretty cool, man. That's a cool, uh, you know, view to take on it as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. That'd be pretty slick. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a good one. Let me put like that it. back in I see you've got the uh, Alexi Leo ESP. 
Yeah, I got the Lexi Leho. I, I mean, Lexi is definitely um one of the most influential, I think, metal player for that for that generation that you know, in the with children of Bodom. You know, unfortunately, you know, right, yeah. he passed away. Yeah, unfortunate way. So I got I got that as a, and I have it on display as a tribute to him. Just you know, to spread the word about. Yeah. So all these guitars back here are these. <clears throat> are these all your guitars or I mean, or some of these like ones from the Becker thing that were donated or I don't know that they had for the, did you had on the show? Um, what? These are all mine. All the Jason Becker donated guitars are either sold or they're still at the store. Or, gotcha. you know, was See, is, that a, is that a Sinister Gates model back there? Yes. I have a Sinister Gates one here that Shaq sent me to, to check out. Um, I have the Chrome 30th Satriani here. Sick. I always wanted one, you know, since the Extremist album. I have the White Gem, of course, the Jason Becker Yin Yang guitar. I got my PRS Custom, which is like a private, like a one-off, and like a, another private stock there, and a, one of my signature, the old signature of my Ivanez, and the seven string. Oh, sweet. Um, yeah. Nice, man. So this is retired now. It's got the... You know the race car, sports car, chameleon color, and it's based on one of my basic. Rusty, you know about this. So many st seven string guitars have baseball bats. I I don't know what what planet they're making guitars <laughs> for. All right. You know, it's like there's already the neck is already wide. Wide, right? You need thin necks, and when you yes. play the original universe, the neck will nice and thin. Yeah. And then, and then suddenly everyone, you know, I, I brought that LG 7620, the neck was way too big. It's like, I bought it and it's like, so this is a nice thin neck seven string that I tooled with. Does that have, um, have, have 24 frets on it? 24 frets, um, some custom Dimasio and- Low pro edge. So we got, um, actually it's an edge zero, zero bridge. Okay. Unfortunately, Ivan doesn't really do this bridge anymore they kind of try to discontinue it because they have to pay a, you know this kind of lawsuit and stuff they have to pay a royalty on it um mm. to i think sophia so the guy from sophia ah, Bridge. i see um you know he's got a tram settler there which is which is good and it's good if you play e standard mm -hmm. or standard because they work well in that but if you start playing heavier gauge string they don't really work i mean the main point is that when you bend the string all the other guitar strings stay in tune. Oh. So the bridge don't move forward. Look, you look here. See, I'm uh -huh. bending the string and the bridge don't move forward. So it's still, you can still do all the, you know, stuff without having to bend two strings. And um, that's what people hate about double locking bridge, right? It just, it's working against you. You're doing a vibrato and it's the bridge is going against you all the time. Um, so all my guitars have a trem settler on them. So it behaves, it behaves <laughs> like a fixed bridge, but you yeah. got all the goodness of the full floating system. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. I've seen, uh, I think I was hanging out with the guys in Unearth one night. Ken Susie has some kind of bridge on his guitar where he, you can set it up so that when you vibrato, it doesn't even vibrato. I think that's an Evertune, isn't it? That's yeah, the Evertune, isn't it? it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Um, it's, it's weird. Just, man. It's weird to play in vibrato and not hear vibrato. Well, you can adjust it so you can still do the vibrato on it. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, he had his that... setup just like hardcore. Like you know what I mean? He's like, is he? A, he's a rhythm player though. No, no, he plays no. lead. But I think that's how he had it set up for that gig or that one guitar. I don't know. Yeah, I've seen people use the Evertunes for recording because they don't have like that indiscrepancy between takes because of the vibrato. But you know, I don't know. It freaks me out. Yeah. It's like you, you hit the power chord on the, if you hit the power chord too hard, you know, on the normal guitar chord, you hear the guitar, you hear the tune, strings going out of tune, going wah, wah, right. That wah, wah. Horrible. Wah. It takes that away because that drives you insane when you're recording because I don't know, when you're recording, do you feel like your ears is tuned in a different way? It picks up every single little detail. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah. And I think it's, it's, I'm kind of on the fence on that or ever tune thing. It's like, well, some of the greatest album I listened to was perfect for the imperfection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah. 
are we, you know, and we're always trying to perfect product production with technology and everything, or are we going too far in the end? You know, I think the organic is... auto tune, no yeah. auto tune. Not, you're auto tuning the guitar now. Yeah. Um, in a certain way. Yeah. 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 I think I think I like the organicness of just raw guitar, man. Plug it in and let it, you know, let the notes fall where they fall. You know. And if you need to do a punch in, punch it in. But you know, that's about as far as I'll go. You know. I mean, nowadays kids do all kinds of crazy stuff where they're not really even playing it. You know, slow it way down, then speed it up. I don't know, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's nuts, man. I'll show, I'll show you this one. This is the bastard child that I created. Um, um, like why is it the bastard man. child? Because it has an Ibanez bridge on the PRS guitar. Oh. <laughs> it sure does, man. <laughs> the same bridge. Um, but this, this, this is probably my favorite guitar at the moment. Um, in the evolution of my playing, because now, you know, with the Twitch thing, I do so much jams with people and we jam over different kinds of music. So this one have the most diverse tone in terms of like configuration of the pickups and um, with the Neil Fishman stuff on it and a different take on the PRS, you know, a thin PRS. Yeah, I like it. I like that. With flame. a fast neck. Flame, yeah. Thin neck. Yeah. Um, That's always been my, uh, I don't want to say issue, but you know, the PRSs typically have that, you know, they're real thin down by the headstock and they get really fat up by the body. And that, that always kind of like made me not gravitate towards those guitars, but I have played one, maybe not like that, but real thin neck. And they kind of had it more of a constant flow all the way up. And I was like, Oh, this is probably one of the best guitars I've played ever. Like, so I don't, I think it's just kind of Schecter's are that way too, you know, real skinny down by the headstock and then they get kind of fatter up by the body. And I like more of a constant neck myself. Yeah, those, those, those seven and eight strings have like baseball bat necks cut in half on them. Pretty ridiculous. Yeah. They get pretty fat. Yeah, it makes it possible to play. It's, it is, I mean, I think the audience, in case they're wondering why, I mean, you know, it's cheaper and you got less chances of error when you make a baseball bat neck. When you make a thin neck, it costs a lot more money. If things go wrong, you yeah. start whopping and stuff. And you have that means you need a more expensive piece of wood. Right. And then right. you have to go for laminated neck, you know, to and like having like titanium in the middle or bubinga, yeah. whatever, a, fun, a way to solve it. So it's come down to cost, right? So I, I got here a thin neck and it's not laminated. This is a one piece wow, super that's awesome. thin neck. So you think of the piece of wood that costs money here. Um, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's, it's just the cost, right? Um, what can you do? I'm sh I mean, your, your guitar, Rusty, that's not cheap. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, there's a lot of work in those. And, you know, this, like you said, you got the reinforced necks and all that stuff. So the two Babenga in the middle, is that Babenga? Yeah, like yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's Wenge. Oh, is it on this? It's Wenge. It's Wenge Maple. I should know that. <laughs> I, bought, I bought I bought two of them, so I know. Maybe, Zach, you can tell me, how come Wenge became a popular thing now? It, it didn't exist. No one's using it for, for years. Now, why is it a Wenge neck is suddenly like a thing? I don't really know either. Uh, I had asked my dad about it because he tunes pianos and stuff, and they use Wenge and pianos to reinforce them a little bit. And I just wonder if the it is more cost effective because I think that maybe that it not being as popular that they can charge a little bit less for it, you know, like it's not so out of stock that they can actually use some of it. So, I mean, maybe that's why maybe the other woods are just becoming scarce. So they're charging it, you know, I think that didn't happen with Gibson or something. They got in trouble for using certain woods that they weren't supposed to be using because they was... were like in uh, endangered wood or something. I think it was Ebony. Maybe it know. was Ebony, yeah. Because I know Ebony was hard to get for a while. But I, I might do more research on that because Wenge, you know, it seems like a lot of people are using that now. You know, even just as a reinforcer, not a full Wenge neck, you know. I've I like seen, it. yeah, Wenge neck. I was like, oh, wow, interesting. I really like the Zebra wood. I don't yeah. know if you've ever seen the guitars with that. It's just so sweet. I'm looking to get one of these Tellys, you know, because I have my Adkins guitars that I had made. And... uh and I'm looking to get a telly made from all zebra wood. It would be like a zebra neck and a zebra body. So 
that'll be pretty sweet. But I don't know the quality of that wood necessarily. I don't know how it stands up to other woods. Yeah, it's it's pretty good because it's I've seen it used a lot in more high end uh, exotic guitars and stuff like that. So it's got to be pretty good. The zebra wood. Yeah. Well, it was not going to be a cheap guitar to build, so it'll be. <laughs> I mean, look, with, with the data and the information of on guitars, right, and the internet, it makes people more and more snobby. Even though no one really, really need all these things. It's almost like, do you need to drive a Lamborghini to go to the supermarket? Right, exactly. It became like this. It's like, do I? Yeah. Do most people need a guitar like this? Mm, probably not. But you know what? If the lawyer can buy a Lamborghini, fuck it. Yeah. They're going to get it, <laughs> right? Yeah. This luxury goods, we're talking about luxury guitars. Yeah, man, for sure. Yeah. Well, I think that Rusty, you said that about your, just in guitars, like you you wanted to make the Lamborghini of a guitar. Was it a Lamborghini or a Ferrari? Yeah, yeah. You, that, my old signature model, I, part of my pitch was it was this, the Lamborghini of seven strings. Yeah. Built for speed and performance. Yeah. You know, you, you have your got little old, pupper. Yeah. You get your good old American workhorse guitars like Fender and Gibson, but then you need the, the, uh, the speedster, man. That's what, that's what these things are for. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Does everybody need 27 frets? Probably not. I do now. Yeah. <laughs> Once yeah. you start using 27 frets, you can't uh, go back, dude. Yeah. yeah. What scale is it? It's uh, on the high E side, it's 25.5. And on the low B, it's uh, 26.2. So it's just a very slight fan and it all goes the same direction and then it straightens out at the, you know it finally straightens out at the bridge on a normal fan fret guitar the fan will start one way and then it'll straighten out and then it'll go back the other way or or just depending on which way you need to do it i've got an eight string guitar that has a high a string on it so the fan goes the opposite way um of an eight string that has a low f sharp you know what i mean because i'm you have to have a, a smaller scale on the high side because you try to tune a string to a Right, you know what I mean. So the scale on that I think is like twenty three point four, or twenty three point five, or twenty four point five. I can't remember. I think it was a twenty four. That sounds more right. On the high A side, maybe I think that's what you had said at one point to me. Okay, yeah, and then the low B side is twenty five point five. But you know, but but with that kind of fan, you know, the the nut is on an angle like this, and the bridge goes the opposite way because it it curves. You know, it's because you're smashing that high side in, making it shorter. Um, which is pretty cool, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, there, there are rumors out there that the, the Ibanez universe was originally supposed to have been released with a high A string, but, you know, they, they kept breaking the string on it. So they threw a low B on it to uh, save all the time invested into it. You know, I don't know how much how true that is, but um, you kind of cool, you know, you can't you can't tune uh, a string to A on a 25.5 scale or even like a Gibson scale. I'm, I'm not sure what Gibson is. It's a little bit shorter. Either one of you guys know what Gibson scale necks are? Uh -uh. I know PRS is between Gibson and Fender. Mm -hmm. that, you know, your guitar is typical. I would say people buy it. It's like the lawyer guitar, right? It's like buying the, the fucking the sports car. It's like, well, I, I'm probably not going to do much. <laughs> I'm not going to take the corner at 200 miles per hour. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or like, I'm not going to do the seven string sweeping in yeah the, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, but, but you can yeah you can if you want to but um you gotta work for it sure yeah sure man mm -hmm. that's for sure um so dude tell me about like you know once you got struck by the guitar bug man you know what was practicing like for you that's something <sighs> you, i mean obviously at some point you had to take it serious you know as much as like instructional videos put you to sleep and stuff, there was some point in some serious woodshedding in there. You know what I mean? There was no time to waste. It's like, I love this music. I'm going to spend every second I got in my life and do that. And I'll just launch into, well, actually the first week I thought, wow, you know, I should, before I started playing the guitar, I thought, you know, if I can play a few chords, that's good enough because this stuff is way too difficult. And then when I got the guitar, I was like, why am I not learning these things? Why would I limit myself and not do that? So I, um, I was lucky that um, there was a shop that was renting out this instructional music video. I know they're not supposed to, but they were renting them out. So um, early on, I got, I saw those um, Frank and Bali monster picking 
you know, Monster Lake Street Picking. Um, Steve Morse, the introduction, I think. Steve Morse video. Um, Frank and Barley Modes, No More Mystery. Um, Michelangelo, Starlex video. Steve Lucas, uh, Starlex video. You know, all the, all the whole lot there. And I just went to work, you know, learning scales, learning the modes, and just trying my best. I didn't take any guitar lessons or anything like that. Um, they had some classical lessons in school they would give to students for free, but they got kicked me out after three lessons. They said, you, don't need, <laughs> you know, you're not learning classical music. What are you for? Um, <laughs> well, that, that's, yeah. that's, that sounds very similar to, to me as well, because I, I, did, I didn't start playing guitar until I was 15. And I thought that was a late start. You know, you know, my, some of my guitar heroes like Randy Rhodes had put out an album when he was 18 or 19, like with Quiet Riot. So I'm thinking like, well, I got to catch up, you know, and um, <clears throat> It was the same way. It was instantaneous. And when I decided to play guitar, it was just like, that was it. I just went and, you know, spent all my time playing guitar, you know, went from being a popular kid to school to having maybe one or two of friends that both played guitar. You know what I mean? We were the guitar nerds and, you know, I, I tried taking lessons. My mom signed me up for guitar lessons in a guitar shop. And after the first month, the guy said, I can't teach this kid. He's not learning, you know, because every week I'd go in and say, hey, man, check out this new lick, you know, my friend showed me or Van Halen riff or something. And, uh, you know, so I wasn't doing my homework and learning Mel Bay book one and, you know, open chords. You know, I was 15, man. I wanted to rock. All that stuff's exactly. boring. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just wanted to rock. I didn't care about, I just wanted to play some stuff that I want to hear. And I, th I think, you know, we all ha came across this feeling when we first started, right? We always think, and I get a question all the time, I'm sure you too, is, is it too late? Am I too old to start playing the guitar? No, you can start playing guitar any age. It doesn't matter. Okay, you know, you might, you might not, you know, people think that way because you see everyone like, oh, this prodigy at the age of 16, 17 playing, they've been playing for 10 years already. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, you can start martial arts anytime. You might not, gonna, you might not be the UFC champion, yeah. but does it really matter? Is it what we're going for? We're just going for fun. So just want to shout out everybody. I have Stop. that. I have that conversation all the time with my students that come here, you know, because they'll look at you and, and, you know, of course, all of us have experienced it where they're like, well, I, I play pretty good, but I'm not as fast as you. And it's like, well, why yeah. would you want to be like, is that really what you want? Or is that what you think you want to do? You know, or is that You're, what you think I want you to do? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the other thing. Like, yeah. I mean, dude, you, you don't. And I, I said that to uh, Johnny Highland. And I was, he was like, oh man, I'm nowhere near as fast as you and Rusty. And, and I was like, yeah, but you're Johnny Highland. Like yeah. we don't need another Rusty Cooley or a Zach or a Herman. We need a Johnny Highland, you know, we need that. And people, and I, I've said that to people too, kind of like with the mixed martial arts thing, because one of my students, he got seventh place in the world and he's 55 years old and he's still kicking ass. And he's like struggling with playing. And I'm like, yeah, but do you like playing ACDC? He goes, oh, I love it. I'm like, well, then there you go. Why do you need to even worry matters. about it? Just keep and it's doing great. Right. It's great starting off playing if you, when you're an adult because you understand, you can put things together already, right? What I need to learn. And the beginning part of the guitar playing is really fun because you learn so much things so quickly. And then the hard thing is when you, when, you are a comp, when you're an intermediate guitar player, oh shit, to get to that next level, you got to work it 10 times harder to get up that little bit better, um, whatever better means, you know, but technically and things like that. So the, the, fun, the best part of playing the guitar is the beginning, for sure, I think. I remember the, the defining moment for me that, that what took my guitar playing to the next level was Paul Gilbert's first in video, Intense Rock. That was, I, that was the perfect thing that I needed just at the right time to just help me take my playing to the next level. I remember learning every lick on that video inside and out, practicing it fucking for hours, man. It was great, for sure, man. You mentioned something, Herman, earlier about um, the store that rented out all the videos, right? I used to teach at a guitar shop that did the same thing, so I would take them home every night and had two VCRs and I would record them. So I've got, I still have boxes of all those old instructional videos, man. That's bad to do, uh, Rusty. All, yeah, well, you know, it was, it was back before uh, Napster or something like that. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, but... <laughs> I have all those, man. I got boxes of uh, boxes of all those VHS tapes. Now I just need to convert them over so I can still watch them. Um, but they're all on YouTube anyway. Someone yeah, that's chucked them on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, it's 
I, you know, for me, it's not about learning the legs. I think each video, I probably learn about one or two legs maximum, never a full thing. Because like Michelangelo's video is like, fuck my life. You know, <laughs> how am I going to play yeah. this shit, Mikey? You know, how am I going to alter it? It's like the way he, sometimes his video, they kind of destroy you before you even started. It's like, man, this guy's so good. How the f- how am I going to get there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always learn a little bit bite sides and chunk and that, that would do. And, but I think it's about inspiring to go, you know what? You know, this is, this is fun. This looked great. I really want to do it. Um, I think the most helpful for me was probably the modes, no more mystery one. There's no legs in it. It just explains mm-hmm. you the theory behind guitar playing. How, how come I hear these instrumental albums? They got all different moods. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, the Aeolian and the Phrygian. I uh, hear Satriani. Why it sounds this way? It's like, oh, I, got, I understand the modal chord progression mm-hmm. is how you create those moods, moving the bass around. Yeah, exactly. Um, that was an eye-opening thing for me. I learned that same stuff from Frank and Bali's books. I have his technique book one and two as well. And that's, that's where it uh, really clicked how to make the modes sound like modes. You know, because for the longest time, I would play things and, you know, I understood what they were intervallically, like, oh, this is a fifth or a minor sixth or something like that. But I didn't really understand how it was impacting the harmony. Like if you play a perfect fifth power chord and then move your pinky up a half step, and then you're playing a minor sixth interval, but you're not, it's not really, it's, it's, in, it's an inverted major third, just creating like, you know, if you're playing E5 and then you move your pinky up a half step, it becomes like C major with E in the bass. So I'm, I'm, I was not understanding it correctly or analyzing it correctly. Therefore, I wasn't able to play over it properly. You know what I mean? So th- that whole uh, Gimbali's method really, really helped uh, understand the modes. And I think Satriani did something one time. I don't know if it was a column or uh, on a video lesson or something where he took all the modes and played them parallel, like off of an E on the fifth string and then kept the low E string droning. And you can really hear the differences in the modes when you, when you do that little parallel trick as well. I think most people, when they learn the modes, they learn them as a derivative approach, all derived from one key. And when you first learn the modes, you're not, you know, you don't know how to write with them. So they all just kind of sound like the major scale. But as soon as you play them parallel, they they no longer sound the same. You know, that's where the differences are, where each half step or whole step um, comes in. So that was a a good approach to hear as well. I use that a lot to teach, you know, because people can instantly go, oh, yeah, I hear the difference in that. You know, it becomes super obvious. So. I got that same thing when I watched Vinny Moore because he did a mode thing and he was basing it off of like a B or whatever. And, okay. and then, and I finally understood it. His was the only one that ever made sense to me. Right. You which, know? Wouldn't, which video was that? He had like that white Ibanez that was all like weird speed spackle speed color. Accuracy, oh, accuracy and speed picking. Is that yeah, the one? yeah. Yeah. His, his first one. Yeah. It might've okay. been. He had big poofy hair out to here. Oh yeah, man. The white Ibanez yeah. is sick dude. But it yeah. was the first time that modes actually, because, you know, yeah, like you said, the derivative approach, which is how mm-hmm. I think people get it right away. But then they go, OK, well, now what the fuck? Like I the, when I talk about modes with students and let's say, you know, you're playing in C and you're playing C Ionian or D Dorian or E Phrygian, whatever. I don't look at it you know, like like we had talked about, Rusty, where you don't really look at it as a different scale. Right. It's all C major. Right. But I will think of it on the guitar from a guitar perspective that I'm in the E Phrygian position on the neck. Like that's how my brain interprets that better. So it's like I can play all my C Phrygian or my C Ionian in this E Phrygian position. Boom. And then I have that whole part of the neck taken up and then you move right. up and up and up. And then the whole neck becomes open to you rather than here's my pentatonic box in the one position. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's at least that's how my brain. Yeah. I mean, I, there's a, there's a ton of ways to think about it. And as a teacher, it's kind of, it's kind of tricky sometimes because, you know, I'll find myself with the way I used to explain it years ago compared to sometimes the way I explain it now uh, as is different because I kind of used to think about it or I'd explain like, like you're doing extended run. It's like, okay, I'm in G major. Now I'm cutting through the Dorian position. Now I'm cutting through the Phrygian position, etc. But it's like, I have to make sure that I explain to them. It's like, you're not actually in the Dorian tonality. You're just running through that position because all the modes have the same exactly seven notes. So it's it's you know because I'll hear people talk about it and go, oh yeah, now I'm in Dorian. Well, now I'm in Phrygian. It's like, well, no, you're not. Not really. It's still major scale. You know what I mean? You're still playing in C. So it's it's tricky with the wording, but but the derivative approach is definitely the way to go at first because uh, you know otherwise you're learning seven keys at once. You know. Uh, yeah. You know, I think the that. video. <laughs> the v another video I liked, which came later, was um, Brett Gars. Oh yeah, um, rock fusion because 
it's like it doesn't really matter any note you can play any note it's just about the sitting note the note you yeah. sit on with the chords yeah. the passing notes that. play whatever you want who cares yeah. you know if they don't sit it doesn't matter so that was a really eye-opener for me to understand is that what does this you, you can think of it it's there is no key yeah yeah you, you i, I ha- target the sitting note if right. it's going to move or it's going to sit yeah <laughs> i had a student say that to me because i posted about you know because we were learning modes you know real trying to get specific with it you know so that way you could see it and then i came out with a video later you know because then you level up you level up you add different modes and you can modulate into them whatever and i just started playing all every chromatic tone i could think of inside of just a regular lick and then he comments on it and he goes so what you're saying to me is everything you just taught me yesterday was bullshit i can hit any note and it'll sound good and i said well it's okay yeah sure <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. he was just messing with me, but he was just like, he's like, why even learn all this other stuff? I was like, because once you know it, then those other notes don't get so scary, you know? Yeah. Or you can figure out a way to explain it. There is you know, no I, wrong, I, though. Yeah. I was talking with a student. I said, I can, I can explain to you in, in about five minutes why every note in the chromatic scale will work over every chord. You know, all you got to do is if you, you know, to you can take a minor chord and you can use all 12 notes from the chromatic scale over it. If you put enough minor modes together, if you put combine what are the differences you know dorian's got a a major sixth and phrygian's got a flat two and a flat six and natural minor's got well it's got the same thing uh as dorian but you add in harmonic minor and then you end up with a one flat two two flat three and then you know one of the modes from melodic minor what is it uh super locrian's got a flat four which is a major third right so you just put enough of those modes together that all work over minor chord and you end up with all 12 notes from the chromatic scale it's you know so it's it's how you lay into it i think it's if you uh you know if you go into it sheepishly you know people are going to know it but if, if you lay into it you know then it's a little bit more convincing you know you gotta you gotta make people believe you meant it <laughs> and if you play the wrong note you keep playing it a that's few right. times the that's chord's right. gonna change and hopefully you'll get yeah. there yeah you that's know? right <laughs> yeah <laughs> And in many respects, you're a half step away from a good note. Yeah, you're <laughs> you know? always half a step away from being right, dude. That's, yeah, that's pretty that's, funny. It keeps man. me from being stressed out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, listen, man, Herman, dude, it's been awesome. Uh, we appreciate your time, dude. I know you're probably busy and got a lot of things going on. Um, I got some lessons coming up myself at two. So, man, I just want to tell you thank you again for coming on the show. Really appreciate it, dude. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to um, glad to be here to talk about. You know, some stuff that we don't usually talk about outside in the real world because they think we're weird. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was All really right. great to meet you, man. I appreciate you coming on the show and, you know, we'll have you back again. Yeah, I'm glad you guys are doing this, you know, for the guitar players out there. You know, it's always great to have more knowledge, yeah. you know, because it's, it's, you need to get as much knowledge from different artists and musicians out there to create your own, you know, yeah, and for people that thing. might not know about your Twitch, uh, you want to go ahead and tell them how to how to find it. Uh, yeah, go to twitch.tv slash Herman Lee, and you know we do all kind of things from guitar setup, talk about guitars, play some stuff, jam, in- improvisation. I'll pick any random track and improvise them. And you can see sometimes I'm good, sometimes I'm bad, sometimes <laughs> I play those same notes again and again. Yeah, hope for that yeah. next next chord. Yeah, um, you know, just cool ch- cool hangout for for people come and talk about guitars and music. 